So hi everyone, my name is Chudo Sugars and this is my colleague Alessandro Villa and we'd like to officially welcome you to the opening of the new Reading Without Borders collection in the EUC library. So first of all, thank you very much for being here tonight. Give yourselves a round of applause please. <laughs> So we really hope that you enjoy this small hour that we have together to celebrate. Uh, we've been working very hard on this collection for quite a while, so we're very happy that we finally get to open it to all students and staff at UC. This event and the Reading Without Borders collection would not have been possible without the Rotterdam Leeskabinet, as it's a collaboration with them, as you can see behind me. And the Rotterdam Leeskabinet is the humanities library of the Erasmus University. They are dedicated to connecting people through fiction as a way of stimulating cultural exchange. Well, um, so you might be wondering by now, what is this Reading Without Borders collection? And it's basically a collection of international fiction. It's all translated to English or originally uh, written in English. And um, we have uh, around 300 new books on the library and they're all ready to be borrowed. So I count on you guys for that part. And uh, this collection has a unique character and uh, uh, it is guaranteed to speak to the diversity and internationality of our community. And uh, uh, of course, let's not forget that we can borrow for free and also staff. <laughs> <laughs> so we have prepared this event. We hope it's special for you and you enjoy it. And uh, the event will start with our own dean, which will be, um, who will be giving the first speech and will be formally uh, opening the collection with her own dean speak. And thereafter, <laughs> we have two special guests. Um, first, Michelle Hutchinson, renowned translator and winner of the uh, International Booker Prize. And last but not least, uh, our own EUC student, Cindy Stewart, who is also a published uh, poet. Um, we were also planning on having a third speaker, um, uh, humanities lecturer, uh, Shalar Kusuglu, but unfortunately, he's uh, ill, so he couldn't come here. But still, to make the event more special, uh, Sebastian West will be uh, delighting us with some nice music. Yeah, so perfect. The event will take until about seven o'clock and afterwards we'll have a reception with some food and drinks, so feel free to join us after as well. Um, we'll also have some of the books on display, just a few hand picks that we think are definitely worth a read, so definitely check that out if you guys have time. And then we also have a merch table where you guys can pick up your own merchandise of this event and of the Rotterdam Slays Cabinet. So, uh, yeah. So, without further ado, <laughs> a big round of applause for our Dean Gabriela Jacobs. Thank you very much. Welcome also from my side. It's a great pleasure to be here and it had been so much fun to see the students and also colleagues preparing this opening here with so much enthusiasm. I have to say over the last two weeks I was already uh, pushed again into also my own reading passion and uh, I got uh, very strict instructions uh, for uh, my little contribution and opening here and I was told not to give a formal speech but to keep it as personal and as informal as possible. So I am uh, going to the this. Um, I'm extremely pleased uh, with uh, our collaboration uh, with the List Cabinet and with the Library, and I'm so much looking forward also to, uh, to our guests here. And it is so wonderful to see all of you here and to see how much success this event is already. So also really a big, big compliment uh, to everyone who organized this. So. As I said, I was asked to keep it very personal, um, which meant that I was 
looking into my own journey of reading and into my own journey of uh, reading uh, without borders. I am a, a cross-cultural psychologist, um, so uh, by training um, I'm extremely interested into the role of culture. And when I looked um, now over the past days into my own library at home, um, I picked as the first book my favorite book from when I was 12. And this book is called Damals war es Friedrich, uh, from Hans-Peter Richter. Um, this is a, a quite well-known German book uh, and ge very ge well-known German author who described in this book um, the horrors of fascism and the horrors of stereotyping. And this book completely impressed me and determined also my research career. Uh, so this left a very big impact on me and um, understanding um, what it means to be uh, constantly uh, aware of the power of stereotypes. The second book I took was uh, my favorite uh, when I was 18, um, Die Blechtrommel, Günther Kras. Uh, also uh, a yeah, very important German book. And here again, what impressed me here in this book was um, this, I think, very honest description of uh, the German population after the Second World War and how deep this trauma goes uh, in societies who have been exposed and have been part of a fascistic and suppressive uh, system. And yet, those books are books that I remember in many uh, situations that I think, yeah, they really uh, uh, help me to understand the world. Uh, then another uh, book I, uh, I picked is Zola, uh, from Zola Germinal. Um, when uh, I started my uh, academic career, I uh, um, worked for one year in Paris uh, at the uh, Haute Etude Commerciale, um, and there was teaching sociology. And uh, something I learned there uh, was taking um, books, uh, classic books, uh, and to understand uh, the, really the culture uh, by understanding and reading uh, 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 classic books. So uh, Germinal also uh, impressed me there. And when I moved 20 years ago uh, to the Netherlands, uh, I found in my bookshelf quite some books I got from my friends and Martin Tart um, uh, also impressed me there and uh, which until today I realized that uh, his books also impressed my way of, um, yeah, of understanding also uh, the Netherlands. When I started here at EUC, uh, I got from my pre-successor, uh, Wim Hafkamp, this book. And uh, this is uh, from a, a Bosnian-Serbian author, uh, Stanisic. Uh, it's called Herkunft, so a German book. Um, what I realized here when reading this book, and I'm quite fascinated with his work, is that um, uh, people who lived in another country, so he came uh, as a, a Bosnian-Serbian refugee um, in 1992 to, to Germany, and the way he uses the German language is so powerful, but is a very own interpretation uh, of German language, which impressed me very much uh, uh, in... Um, uh, um, yeah, also reading across borders can also have an impact, of course, on the own way of, of using language. Then I brought two some very small uh, examples of what reading also really means to me, and this is also, um, yeah, personal guidance. Uh, yesterday, uh, I don't see Miles now, Miles and I uh, were uh, in a little uh, uh, situation here because a seagull has flown uh, uh, against our window and had seriously injured her, I think. Uh, uh, she, she was dying. And we both uh, were waiting uh, for, uh, for, for the uh, animal ambulance to pick him up. And we were talking about seagulls. And I realized one of my favorite books uh, in childhood was a book about seagulls and what seagulls uh, mean uh, for uh, uh, yeah, the joy uh, 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 in, uh, in flying and that flying is not only something that you, you do for instrumental reasons. 
And I was remembered of Paul Auster, Timbuktu, uh, which is for me one of the most impressive books uh, when uh, it comes to animals and the role of animals, uh, uh, which also really impressed or left uh, on, uh, on me um, in my relationship with, uh, with animals. So coming to the Dean's pick, uh, I have uh, chosen um, a book from uh, Chimamanda Adishi. Chimamanda Adishi had been uh, the commencement speaker uh, for, uh, for uh, our last uh, cohort. And um, she had been, also when it comes to reading across borders or without borders, um, very important. Her book or her speech then, uh, The Danger of a Single Story, um, her TED Talk, um, I think extremely well expresses uh, why it is so important to write in your own language and to write in your own uh, way of being uh, because uh, there she describes that when she was little, um, she was a very early writer, uh, not surprising, uh, at the age of seven, she only wrote stories about white, where white people with blue eyes uh, talking about the weather, uh, eating apples, playing in the snow, uh, 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 were the protagonist. Um, even though she later realized talking about the weather does not make so much sense in Nigeria because the sun is there all the time. You don't you eat mango and not apples, and of course, you're not white and blue-eyed. Um, and she had the feeling then that, um, yeah, uh, you cannot be a protagonist. Uh, uh, she cannot be a protagonist in, in, in literature. Um, so this was, for me, a very impressive uh, 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 eye-opener. Talk she had about we should all be feminists um, was a book that had um, a very strong impact on me because when it came out, I think 2012, um, I was in a stage in my career where I was for the first time then being a mother of three kids, but uh, being at a relatively advanced stage in my career, I was for the first time confronted really with, I would say, sexism uh, in my work. And uh, her work there uh, functioned to me also as a, as a sister who helped me to understand uh, what, uh, where, where I was. And uh, the fact that she gave our commencement speech meant so much to me. Uh, so I, am, uh, I also, uh, in preparing uh, this, I uh, also talked to some of uh, our uh, students and realized uh, that it is so powerful that an author like Chimamanda Adeshi can reach so many hearts. Uh, and uh, what she describes here is for me really also the essence of what I think we try to achieve here is to make sure that we live in a society where we can all truly be ourselves and where we can truly step out of our uh, social and cultural uh, small categories um, and expand this. So thank you very much. Good. Okay. Um, thank you, Dean, for that wonderful speech. And um, let's please welcome our next guest with a big round of applause. Hi, um, I'll just stand while I say a few words before my interview with, with Barry here. Um, I, I don't much enjoy giving speeches, and I always feel too nervous to speak off the cuff, which is why I'm standing here with a piece of paper. Um, the thing is, I, I wasn't an eloquent speaker as a child. I was always fearful of saying something stupid in the presence of those better educated or from a higher class. I preferred to hold my tongue than tell a story or express an opinion. However, the less I spoke, the more I read, and the more I wrote. And soon big, books piled, big piles of books were creeping up my bedroom walls. In England, it is very normal to grow up monolingual. All you need is a bit of basic French or Spanish so you can order food on holiday. That's the thought. Alternatively, you could just speak very slowly, or if that failed, shout in English. It wasn't until I was 16 and studying A-level French that I read a book in another language. And it wasn't until I got to university I studied comparative literature at UEI um, in Norwich, that I became aware of translations into English. Most people in England read with borders. Slowly but surely, though, things are changing. 
and the 3% of books published in English being translations has now risen to about 6%. Running tandem to the need to increase representation of diversity in culture has been a growing awareness of other less visible co contributors, like editors, or in my case, translators. Never before have we had a stage like we do now, invited to speak at events, interviewed by the press, or even invited to a royal lunch. Rotterdam Lays Cabernet is dedicated to connecting people through international fiction as a way of stimulating cultural exchange. Unlike England, there is a strong tradition of translation in the Netherlands and a long awareness of the literary treasures to be found in other countries and cultures. In a way, I wish this library was opening in Bedford or Grimsby, not in Rotterdam. But at least the riches to be found in English translation are all being brought together to form a val valuable resource here for readers of English, whether that is their first language or not. I'd like to close by reading a short section from On Earth We Are Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vuong which is not a translation, but a letter a boy growing up in America addresses to his Vietnamese mother. When it comes to words, you possess fewer than the coins you saved from your nail salon tips in the milk gallon under the kitchen cabinet. Often you gesture to a bird, a flower, or a pair of lace curtains from Walmart and say only that it's beautiful, whatever it was. Dep quoi, you once explained, pointing to the hummingbird whirring over the creamy orchid in a neighbor's yard. It's beautiful. You asked me what it was called, and I answered in English, the only language I had for it. You nodded blankly. The next day, you had already forgotten the name, the syllable slipping right from our tongue. And then, coming home from town, I spotted a hummingbird feeder in, in our front yard, the glass orb filled with a clear, sweet nectar, surrounded by colorful plastic blossoms with pinhead holes for their beaks. When I asked you about it, you pulled the crumpled cardboard box from the garbage, pointed to the hummingbird, its blurred wings and needled beak. A bird you could not name, but nonetheless recognise. Dep qua, you smiled. Dep qua. So. Michelle, thank you very much for your talk and for being here with us today. It's really an honour to thank have you, you here. Um, I just wanted to ask you a few questions about the art of translation, because mm. I think it's really an art. And now that I've listened to you, um, to your uh, speech, I was wondering, like, as when you referred to yourself as a child, as somebody who rather did not speak or uh, maybe preferred to shut up in mm. certain instances, I immediately made the connection, like, okay, I wanted to ask her why she became a translator, <laughs> but I, <laughs> now I, I start to get the feel like you really. Uh, appreciate language and you really understand the impact and you are like highly conscious of it it seems as a child already mm. is that like it's just yeah. guessing of course yeah i mean i i loved language but i was also afraid of it i guess <laughs> afraid of saying the wrong thing because you knew the I power just, yeah. right of yeah it. perhaps yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, you've translated well i read it uh, m m over 35 books from um Dutch. From Dutch to, <laughs> yeah. to English. I was like, over 35 books? Do you ever sleep? That seems like an insane, a lot of work, a lot mm. of books. Do you know, I do children's books and graphic novels. So yeah. You start adding and, and poetry, right? <laughs> and poetry, yeah. <laughs> so that helps. So, so it's maybe only, only, I don't know, maybe 17 full-length books, like Still. novels or non-fiction, yeah. Something Still. like that. Yeah. Still. And also one book from French, right? One book from French, yeah. yeah. But Because um, uh, I live here, I always get asked to do Dutch stuff. I think if I lived in France, I'd get more opportunity to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we're happy with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was wondering, since we are talking about translation, and I already mentioned that I would refer to it as an art, what is to you the most common misunderstanding that you conceive of people who talk about uh, translation, for example, people who say, okay, yeah, I prefer to read the book in, original, in the original language. Yeah, um, I think, I think it, you can tell from the questions people ask about translation, how much they do or don't know about it. They, they ask things like, do you actually have to read the books? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> I've been asked, do you read the books? <laughs> and what did you and then say? I wondered no. how you would possibly translate something without reading it. But, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and someone came and congratulated me last, last week for knowing so many words. Like 
okay, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm perplexed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so people don't, uh, people, some people think you have to have the whole dictionary in your head and, and you just type, whereas, you know, I spent half my day looking in a dictionary and looking online and researching things. Yeah, because talking about uh, the process, how does it, how does the book uh, come in on your desk? How does it arrive on your desk? What, do you have anything to say about it? Like which books you want to translate? Do you have to love them? Are publisher, mm. publishers contacting you? Yeah, that's a lot of questions. So yeah. um, the books don't necessarily arrive on my desk. Um, I kind of try and keep abreast of um, what, what's been published and what's well reviewed or what's a bestseller yeah. um, so that I can then have read things if publishers become interested in them and then they're more likely to ask my opinion of you know have you read this book and what do you think um, in, in the case of, of this book The Discomfort of Evening yeah. um, the Dutch publisher asked me to do a sample um, because they wanted to sell the rights at London Book Fair and the so sample is just a few paragraphs? A sample is like the, the first two or three chapters in this case. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, and, so, and, and then they take that to a book fair where lots of publishers from different countries have meetings. And yeah. so they sell not just the rights into English, but into all, all other languages that they can manage. Ah, of yeah. course. Yeah, 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 that's how it works then. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Um, translating this book, uh, you won the International Booker Prize for this translation. Mm. Um, did... Um, your life change after that in terms of what you get to translate? <laughs> it, it meant that I couldn't say no to the next book. <laughs> you, oh. so I'm, I'm now, yeah, I'm now translating uh, Mein Lieber Künsteling. Ah, the um, second uh, book by uh, Marie-Claude Yeah, Kandika yeah, Tannefeld. I mean, the expectation was, was just that I would do it, so... You couldn't it, say no? Like, no. <laughs> Did you want to say no? Um, it's, it's a very difficult and um, kind of harrowing book. It's about a paedophile. And it's yeah. kind of almost all one sentence. So, it, yeah, yeah. You, when you translate something, you, you have to like go through everything that happens in it, also kind of emotionally. So, and does it help to? I mean, do you get a lot of feedback from the author? I mean, if the author is alive, as is the case in this mm. case, um, are you in contact or you just ask I, I questions? Think, yeah, you. I definitely ask questions. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's the best thing about translating living authors. I, I mean, I have yeah. fellow translators who do classics, and and then you can never go and and send an email and say, "What did you mean by this?" So, yeah. No, no email <laughs> yeah. there. No. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. then then what happens? Because I'm very impressed that you even this book seems for me hard to translate if I read the Dutch language, which is like very particular, and it also has a very maybe particular context of a rural. Uh, village in North Brabant, a farming village. Mm. Is it important to relate to, to be able to relate to like the, the context in which the story takes place? Like in this instance, a rural village in the south of Holland. I, I, I think, yeah, it helps if you can relate to it, but you don't absolutely have to because of the amount of research involved. So if you don't relate to it, then, then it is a lot more work. Um, talking to people who can and, and get it, finding out all the background information. So, yeah. I mean, like an author, if an author's going to write about a place they don't know, they'll go there and they'll talk to people who live there. Exactly, and, yeah. and as a translator, you, you do the same kind of thing. Ah, so yeah. you do your research, yeah, go exactly. about places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but I, But I, I grew up in a, in a farming village and I my first job was um, delivering milk. So I, I, ah, okay, so yeah, you could you, relate then. <laughs> yeah, I could relate to stuff <laughs> in there. Yeah. And... Uh, how do you go about the process then in terms of like, as a writer, I imagine a writer is writing a book. The first draft is getting sent to the editor at the publishers. Yeah. Uh, how does it work for you? Is it like the same process that's going Absolutely. on? Absolutely. So, um, I think we did this one installments with, with Faber. They wanted to, they were so excited about the book. Even when, the, before anything happened, they were like, this is an amazing book. This is going to win prizes. Really? <laughs> yeah. So you're like, yeah. it's in the pocket already. <laughs> no. I was thinking like, oh, how do they know? But. Well, maybe they bribed someone. <laughs> yeah. No, but anyway, they were very enthusiastic, so I delivered it in, in stages. And ah. they edited, edited it in stages, and I could also have feedback from the editor on how, um, how much they wanted it to be uh, foreignized or not. So did, were they happy with Bader Vendekroot? 
were they happy with Deutsche Block? Did they need more explanation? Ah, these are the names, the Dutch names in the book that you yeah. kept in the translation, yeah. like literally. Yeah. yeah. There's also this amazing word, because it's on a farm, it's about cows. I recall now that uh, one Dutch word is, is, is uh, blaarkoppen, mm. which is a particular kind of cow, right? Mm. And um, It's a breed of cow. Yeah, yeah. It's, a particular, yeah it's a breed. Yeah. Um, but you kept the name Black Open in the translation, right? Because it's a right? breed of cow, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, so yeah. this is like one it of would, your... It would be strange to change it into a different breed, even though we do have Frisian cattle in England, so we could have called them Frisians. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. the idea was to keep it um, as Dutch as possible, really. Oh, well, so I think that you managed to, to well, yeah. And, yeah. And how did you handle things like um, Sinterklaas, which is also in the book? I think that's a tiny bit of explanation. So yeah, you just uh, kind of coat it in something. Just Yeah, um, yeah. it must be very uh, complicated. It's also like complicated, yeah, yeah. With, with, with things that are very culturally specific like that. Yeah, because yeah. this... I wanted to ask you about like intercultural sensitivities and how mm. well like Dutch and English, um, may, well, how compatible they, compatible they are in terms of sense of humor, perhaps, mm. but also like, are there any taboos that you uh, experience whilst translating from Dutch to English, mm. like things you put in a different way or you get comment about by the first draft readers, like, okay. You're obviously British, so you know, but maybe people say, okay, this might work in Holland, but it doesn't work here or the other way around. Does yeah, it happen? Yeah, that happens a lot. And I think you have to look at it per case. So there's yeah. no one but way of dealing with it all, but there's, there are always tiny little... Like, I've, I've just translated um, Granted Hell Europa oh. by Lee Leonard Pfeiffer. Well, that's also a lot of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And um, it's coming out next April. Ah, okay, great. And um, there's, um, there's Red Kurt. Yeah. <laughs> And I've translated it as cunt, and the editor <laughs> oh. tagged it out with, are you really sure you want to <laughs> use the word cunt? <laughs> yeah. so because it it, because it's so loaded in English, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. Mm. Okay, that's, that's obviously one example. Is mm. there also maybe, um, I mean, because you also would be able to translate, and you did translate from French, mm. would you say that translating into English is perhaps like culturally... Uh, less complicated, or is there a, a sort of stronger connection between Dutch and English? Dutch and English, French and English. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I think it probably is a really long answer. <laughs> but, but I mean, the Dutch and the English do share a sense of humour, and they and they share a kind of uh, love of beer, for example. <laughs> A lot of beer, yeah. and, and, and dark, dark things happening in novels. I mean, that that um, this has done a lot better in England and America, for example. Ah, it has done a lot better. Mm. Okay, and you think that's because of the the, the cultural compatibility? Yeah. 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 Um, what do you think, anyway? About I mean, you have a perfect, I mean, not a perfect, but a great overview of Dutch literature by now, I suppose. Mm. What do you think of it relatively compared to other literature that you read? Is there something specific about it, except for it being dark, as you just mentioned? Mm. That w yeah, that would be to kind of ho generalize horribly and yeah, to, <laughs> to exclude things that... Yeah, so yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, There's nothing yeah. that stands out. I think, I think the countryside is often, you know, there's often like... You know, kind of polder novel, the, the Martin at Heart um, that, you, that you mentioned, or, or this is also a kind of polder novel, so that's definitely a, a theme. So there are themes that run through, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's also, generalizing is always a bit complicated in this mm. sense. Uh, back to the idea of translating, um, and the qu my question about what would you say to people who prefer, who say, I, want, I prefer to read in the original language, what are they missing? What does a translation give extra mm. to a book? Because it depends how good your English is, doesn't it? I mean, you, you, yeah, the, there's a nuance. So, how many nuances are you going to understand or not? Um, I would say read both read the translation and the original. Yeah, yeah. okay, a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah, well, um, why not? <laughs> yeah. And what is your, I mean, because it's your job, you're obviously, you must be a little bit. Uh, well, obsessed is not a very nice word, but you really like language and translating. Where do mm. you get the joy from, from the work itself, from like 
doing the work, finding the right... The, the flow, just coming into the flow and, and, and watching the words kind of just appear on the screen. That, that's really wonderful. And that's the good thing about the, the next Marie Lucas novel that I was going to yeah. tell you in the, in the change room. It's, ah. the, it, it's hardly got any full stops. Uh, and oh, so, so you can just go on and, and go on, on, on and on and on. Yeah, so it's translating itself quite fast, actually. Surprisingly. Yeah, it's yeah. also because you are familiar with her... With uh, the style, perhaps, yeah. With her style, yeah. yeah. And like, this is also that you maybe get a sense of the... I mean, obviously, it's a poet with a very large vocabulary, but mm. do you get, like, feel for certain constructions and words that you... Yeah, yeah, I'm finding my way through dealing with, like, lots and lots of clauses, you know, with about a full yeah. stop and having to make them fit with each other and all the different ways of, like, grammatically, yeah, moving things around so that, so that they do just flow on naturally. Yeah. Have you ever had some, uh, well, I wouldn't say a conflict, but a mild um, uh, difference of opinion with an author about translation, or you always work it out? Yeah, I once did a sample for someone and, and she said, but this doesn't sound at all like my English. And, and, and she'd spent ah, a year in America. And that's so she had like, she'd learned an American English and I'm British English. Ah, um, yes. So she, she just didn't recognize herself in the translation, which was an interesting one. Uh, what, what did you answer? Um, well, then you should have got an American translator. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say, like it's translated from, from not from American, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so but all in all, you you're getting on really well with with your. Tell me, I get on really well with my writers. Yeah. Yeah, they must yeah. be very happy yeah. with you. As a, I mean, it's an honor to be translated, oh. obviously. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, I think uh, we covered a lot time. of ground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very mm. much for this interview. It was really an honor to have you here. Yeah, Thank you very welcome. much.
Okay, everyone, so welcome back. Uh, very short intermezzo, but we want to keep it short and sweet tonight. Uh, we have Cindy Stewart, who will be reciting some of her own poetry, and then afterwards the reception will begin, accompanied by more lovely music by Sebastian. Um, so yeah, let's get it going. Cindy? Uh, hi everybody, uh, I guess some of you already know me. I'm Cindy, I'm a neuroscience major here at the UC and this is my book, Memoria of a Heart. Uh, I published it last year in, uh, the pen during the pandemic and the lockdown uh, on the 1st of July together with Book Scouts. Um, I don't know if any of you know it, but it's a publishing house here in, um, yeah, here in the Netherlands. And it's basically about the journey from toxic relationships and depression and the healing process from it. So I used the five stages of grief to kind of show that healing process and kind of grow from what was before. So today I'll be reading a few poems from my book. It's the first time I'm actually reading some of my poetry. So thank you for listening in advance. <laughs> Thank you. Roses in Paradise. Damn roses in paradise, luring me into a learned suit at hellish gardens, while the only love I requested was yours, in purity and sincerity. A bit of authenticity, and all of your heart belonged to me. I surrendered mine so, so long ago, giving you all I had to give. You knew, you knew all of it. Does this justify my feelings, my pain, my longing, this aching I feel, this tender bitterness I taste. Yet all my soul wishes is to see you smile, feel and kiss her in delight, because I know my absent presence will never be enough, although I wish it to be. Wish myself to feel these damn roses and damn tears. Wind, is there really a way for my words to reach the soul and heart without my voice having to crack open and fail? For my love can fly a thousand miles and light a hundred fires with the burning and pain I feel inside. And my body has too much weight on its longing as it could fall into a coma. So let my body dream and my words ache, letting a whisper out in soft delight and let the wind carry it to its destiny. Ocean, why do I bring myself to wish and long for all you have to offer but refuse to give. Because all of my power and force and strength burns for the thought of being okay and loved and free, powerful and loose without worries of thunder or heat, boldness and cruelty. Because I don't need a sun that enlightens my fright and does the facing for me. For breeding and living for a soul that should be mine but I've lost and left behind. More, more than I want to be loved, taken and held and seen, I want to be free and stream and flow like the waves of the ocean that my heart has to offer. Silence. Silence in my heart, lost in the glistering of the dark, confident and scared, aching for a word, a whisper. I understand, I know, I wish I did before. Time can solve a problem when it's right in front of you, and love can hide a lie that lingered in our hearts. I lost sight, I lost touch. I confused me, I lost me, reminding myself and reminding ourselves that this is how we fell apart. Illusion. My heart wonders if you are a faint speculation of my mind, soul, and imagination. I tried falling and lying and taking and passing, my wings soaked and my halo traded for a horn. Yet I fell and lied and took and passed, and you've become more or less a faint illusion. Thank you. Okay, so really good job, Cindy. Amazing. It was really, really beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, so yeah, before wrapping up this event, I'd just like to say thank you to the speakers for sharing those wonderful words with us, Sebastian West for giving this music, evening a musical twist, and for all of you for being here with us tonight.
Um, so this event once more, and the entire Reading Without Borders collection was made possible with the Rotterdam Lace Cabinet, more specifically Berry and Elspeth, who helped to set everything up. So thank you to them, as well as uh, the student support desk workers, so our colleagues, both former and present. Um, so yeah, let's give them a round of applause. And then, uh, last but not least, we'd like to give a special thanks to the ECLOS organization, as well as OSEA and all other staff involved. Um, so if you haven't done it yet, please take a look um, at our merch table over there. And of course, if you have any questions about the collection, don't hesitate to approach um, any of the student support desk members. And um, before we conclude the evening, um, I would like to point some important aspects of this collection. So first of all, um, it is open for suggestions, because after all it is made by students for students. So we have placed uh, several QR codes around the building and in the library. So if you know a book uh, that you want to suggest, please scan the code and we'll make sure to add it to the collection. And uh, then I also wanted to um, make a reflection about the meaning of this collection. So it's called Reading Without Borders. And I think it's great that our speaker, um, Michelle, um, mentioned like, the, power of, the power of language and how this can create borders or barriers between people. But I just wanted you to reflect on what it is, is it preventing us from getting. And it's a complete whole world of different cultures and realities. But not only that, it's just many different ways of thinking. And um, I would really like to uh, invite you all to look at the collection and uh, select a book that is from a country far away from home. And I guarantee you it's going to open your mind. So. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you very much for being here again, and uh, please enjoy um, food and drinks and the lovely music. Uh, wait a moment. <laughs> I'm very sorry, but I need, we need to thank these students. Alessandro, Chido, Joachim, Hannah, Maus. We worked with these students, they were terrific. We've never experienced such a professionality and enthusiasm in the last few weeks, uh, we years that we organized things. So a big round of applause to the students who made this possible. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, thank you guys so much for coming once again. And now go enjoy the food, enjoy the music, and uh, all the snacks are vegan, so. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.